My practice is sports medicine. I'm with Bucks County Orthopedic Specialists. Uh, we have two offices, one very close to here and then one in Warrington. Uh, with sports medicine, I take care of a lot of shoulder problems and I take care of the whole spectrum of shoulder problems from simple to complicated. Um, so I'm going to go over today. So the, the format that I think works out really well is I'm going to cover the spectrum of uh, uh, shoulder problems and I'm going to spend about half an hour talking about a lot of what I do in the office, how I look at a problem and what kind of uh, buckets they fall into and I will leave plenty of time uh, for questions at the end. We'll do questions and answers for at least another half an hour and then after that I'll end the talk but I'll stay here for as long as people want to ask as many questions as they want. I won't go anywhere. Uh, so to get started, so why does my shoulder hurt? Well, that matters a little bit, but how can I fix it really is the, is the issue. I mean, how do you deal with the problem? First, this is very important because people are terrified of coming to see me because everybody thinks if you come to see a surgeon, you're going to get surgery. So first and foremost, at least two-thirds of my patients never get surgery. So I do need to say that. Um, they get better with non-surgical treatment. We have lots and lots of non-surgical things and that's always where we start. Maybe about a third of people don't get better with non-surgical treatment and end up needing surgery, but I really need to stress that just because you come to see a surgeon does not condemn you to going to an OR, okay? So uh, there, there is hope that you could see me and still not end up in the OR. Um, surgery is always your choice. Even if I say, you know, this probably would do better with surgery. Some patients will tell me, well, that's good. See ya. <laughs> you know, I, you know, they don't, you know, they don't, they can live with it. So that's okay. You know, it's always your choice. This is, um, this is orthopedics. It's not heart surgery. Nobody died of shoulder pain. Uh, so it's, it, you can pick, you can choose. So we give the, you options and you decide what's best for you. Cause only you really know what's best for you. You know, your life, you know, your, your needs, you know what you want to do, you know how much it interferes, only you know what you need. So the ultimate choice on surgery is always yours. Needed to get that out of the way. So when you come to my office, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk. It's called taking the history where I find out from you what the problem is, how it interferes with your life, what things you want to do that you can't do because you have pain. So, oh, what is the history of the pain? That is the first thing we're going to do. Some people have pain only when they're throwing a fastball. Well, that's an easier problem to fix. Some people have pain when they sleep. That's a harder problem to fix because yeah, everybody has to sleep. The other thing we're going to look at is making sure that it's actually the shoulder. Neck pain can mimic shoulder pain. Sometimes even carpal tunnel can run up towards the shoulder. So there are other things that can mimic shoulder pain that we have to look at and make sure that it's not. Uh, I have partners who take care of a lot of neck pain and there is a lot of overlap. Sometimes people have both problems, but usually people have one problem or the other and we need to figure that out. Then we're going to, once we've talked, and I have a good sense of how long you've had pain, where it is, what bothers it, what makes it better, what makes it worse, then we're going to look at you. That's called the physical exam. Where does it hurt? So the location of pain makes a big difference. If you have pain on the top of your shoulder, maybe it's your collarbone. If you have pain over here, it's more likely to be rotator cuff. Pain in the back might be the labrum, pain in the front might be the biceps. So where the pain is means a lot to me as I try to figure out what's causing your problem. Then we're also going to look at what makes it worse. Well, there are some things, uh, again, I'll come back to the collarbone pain. Well, I see that a lot in, in weightlifters. So they, when they're pushing weight, they get pain right here. But I'll see uh, 
throwers who get pain when they're throwing, it's in the back of their shoulder, that might be a labrum. And people with arthritis, unfortunately, have pain with just about everything. I mean, anything that moves is going to hurt when you have arthritis. So that makes a big difference. So what makes it worse? And then what makes it better? Did it respond to an anti-inflammatory? Does it respond to rest? Uh, did you take Advil and it got a little bit better? Uh, ice, does that help it? So some things will make it better. It depends on the problem, but sometimes some things will make it better. So we're going to go through all of that. Very important to me is the range of motion. The shoulder has the greatest range of motion of any joint in your body. If you think about a knee, frankly, a very simple joint. It just does two things. It goes straight and it bends. It doesn't really do much else. It's not meant to twist. It's not meant to go side to side. But a shoulder, I mean, it goes up, it goes down, you go forward, you go back, and then you can twist. It has greater degree of range of motion than any other joint in your body. And how different shoulder problems limit that makes a big difference to people's function and pain. So three simple things that I'm always going to look at. The first is elevation. How high up can you get it? You know, are you here? Are you here? Are you here? And I'm going to, I'm going to say how many degrees of elevation we have. The second one I'm going to look at is external rotation. So I'm going to have you sit there with your elbows in at your side and see how far you come out. And everybody's a little bit different here, so I'm going to look at both sides because somebody, one person's normal is different than another person's normal. So I want to make sure that both sides are similar, and if there's a difference, then I want to, uh, that matters, I'll note that. And the last one is internal rotation. This is one of the hardest ones to do. Um, and it's one of the easiest ones to lose because most of us, you know, you get dressed in the morning and you tuck your shirt in or whatever, but, uh, but that's about it. Um, the rest of life is in front of us, so we don't really put our hands behind our backs very often. So internal rotation is one of the ones that you lose first when you have a shoulder problem. There's somebody who's very strong. <laughs> so I'm going to check your strength. So we're going to go through those range of motions again, but then I'm going to push against you in all those different directions. And we can have weakness because of pain, and you can have weakness with very little pain. So if you have weakness because of pain, doesn't really tell me, I, that tells me you have pain, but I can't really pinpoint what the problem is. But if you have a rotator cuff tear, sometimes you'll have a lot of weakness and not necessarily an awful lot of pain. You just can't do it because the muscle isn't hooked up to your bones anymore. So with a big tear, you're very weak with a little pain, but not a lot. If you have uh, arthritis or a frozen shoulder, you're gonna have, you won't be able to do it because it hurts too much. So checking somebody's strength, very important. That's the next thing I'm gonna do. Then we get to tests. So I've done my phys I've taken my history. I've done my physical exam. I probably have some ideas of what's going on at this point. Then we're going to do tests. Everybody know everybody's heard of X-rays and MRIs. Uh, X-rays are very helpful. We do them in the office. It's uh, it's usually very simple to get an X-ray. That's going to tell me a lot about arthritis. That'll tell me a lot about bone spurs or calcium deposits. It won't really show soft tissue. Soft tissue does not show up well on an X-ray at all. For an, for soft tissue, that's ligaments, tendons. I need to go to the MRI. And so in this picture here. Uh, like this hole right here is a rotator cuff tear. That's what a rotator cuff tear looks like on an MRI. And when I look at that, it's, it's very obvious. Um, so MRIs are terrific for soft tissues and tendon tears and labral tears. I'm going to go through four of the most common causes of shoulder pain that I see in the office. I'm going to see uh, impingement. 
that's when people don't have any tears, but they have bursitis. It also is the same thing as bursitis, and it's extremely common. It's probably the, the single most common cause of shoulder pain. The great thing about impingement and bursitis is that it's reversible. We can treat it, it can get better, it can return to normal. That's when people, it's often the result of falls or overworking it, and uh, uh, people are gonna have pain when they come around like this. Um, uh, we'll often treat it with anti-inflammatories. Arthritis uh, uh, is a chronic problem. It's, it's changes in the bone and the joint that are permanent. Uh, we can work around it, we can make it as good as possible, but I can't actually get rid of it without surgery. A frozen shoulder is when the joint stops moving, and a rotator cuff tear is when the tendons that cover the shoulder get torn. So let's do that a little more specifically. So this is impingement, and in this picture, if you can make it out, you, well, the, 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 the uh, yellow star shows where the ball of the shoulder is rising up and getting pinched underneath this bone. If you feel it, the bone on top is called the acromion, and the shoulder ro rolls underneath that bone. So when they are bumping into each other on the underside, you're feeling the top side of the acromion here, but when they bump into each other on the bottom side, they can get, they can rub, causes friction, and if that becomes inflamed, that's what impingement is right there. Oh, and the picture does show the bursa is right there in between the two of them. That's why it's also uh, bursitis is another name for impingement. Arthritis. If you see the, the one on the left is an x-ray, the one on the right is a, um, an illustration of the same x-ray showing the degree of arthritis. When you're born uh, your cartilage really looks like, or when you're young, it looks like wet glass. It's bright white, it's glistening, it's, it's extremely smooth and hard. Uh, everybody's cartilage gets a little soft with age, and some people, you know, more so than others. When it hits the more extreme level, you get uh, a, a very rough surface, and uh, you can actually feel some vibration when the joint moves, uh, and when it gets more advanced, you get to be bone on bone um, with large bone spurs that form. The bone spurs aren't the problem, they're, they're the result of the problem. On this picture, you can see a, a bone spur right here, um, right there underneath the neck. And then they form as a result of arthritis, and that actually starts to block motion also. Uh, and when that happens, it, 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 we try non-surgical treatment. Oftentimes, this is the one that will lead to the joint replacements. It's the arthritis. Frozen shoulder is uh, a, a real, relatively common. It's, a, it's, it's somewhat of an enigma. A lot of times, we never know exactly what causes the frozen shoulder. It can be the result of an injury. It can be the result of uh, a fall or surgery, or sometimes people just get it and they never really know why. You might have had a cold or a virus that went to your shoulder and caused the fro frozen shoulder. Uh, sometimes we just never know the actual cause. But it is what it sounds like. The shoulder freezes up and it stops moving. And what happens is, if you look at the picture on the left there, that's normal and there's this big capsule around the shoulder and there's lots of space and room for the shoulder to move. But in the second picture, that capsule that surrounds the joint gets, fro gets uh, inflamed and then it shrinks. It literally shrinks down and becomes scarred and that's what binds you down and you can't move your arm. Uh, the only way out of that is an awful lot of physical therapy, uh, sometimes cortisone shots, rarely surgery with this problem, uh, and it can, it can linger for, for many months. It's a very, well, all these problems are annoying, but this, is a, this one's very annoying too. And then another extremely common, and I think everybody's heard of rotator cuff tears. This is sort of a dreaded problem. Uh, there are 
four muscles that cover the top of the shoulder joint. They're underneath, you've all heard the name of the deltoid, but underneath that, there are four muscles. And they're fairly small muscles, and those muscles turn into tendons as we come out near the end, on the side there, right where they attach. And right at their attachment point, where the arrow is in the picture, that's where the tendons are attaching to the bone, and that's where people get their tears. Uh, it's most often the result of wear and tear. Uh, it's less commonly uh, one injury that people can point to and say, oh yeah, that's where I got it. Um, it's usually just, uh, you know, lifelong use. I, uh, I make a point, I, when people say, oh, is it age? I never, ever, ever say age. I always say use. Uh, so that's the result of use. Um, nope, not age, just use. Uh, if you never used your shoulder, it wouldn't happen. So it's the result of use. Um, so that's where it uh, often ends up requiring surgery to fix because these just don't heal themselves. Sometimes people can live with tears and be happy, um, but if it hurts and it interferes with your lifestyle, then fixing it is typically, surgically, is the way to go. So treatments, we kind of hinted a bunch of these. I always will try to start with the least invasive treatments and then work down the list. Because the least amount of intervention that works is what we want. So we're going to start with getting rid of inflammation. Inflammation is often a root cause of pain and uh, uh, a swelling in the shoulder joint, and that is really what limits you. So most of the time when people have come to my office, they've already tried Advil or Aleve or something that their primary care doctor has put them on. Not all the time, but most of the time they've come to me and they've already tried that. So I'm usually not repeating things that people have already tried. So I'll often go to an injection uh, of cortisone because they haven't tried, people, folks haven't tried that yet. Um, injections are uh, typically a steroid. There are several different types. I have my favorites. We combine the injection with lidocaine, which is a numbing medicine. So the, in the syringe that I give, there's a combination of lidocaine and the steroid. Um, I typically will freeze the skin with a spray first. Uh, people are often very afraid of, of injections. I will tell you that uh, almost always I hear people tell me, oh, I thought it was going to be a lot worse than that. Really, um, steroid injections are typically not as bad as the hype that they get. Um, they do work quickly and the medicine strong, so that's a great thing. And with the numbing medicine in there, a lot of times people, even before they leave the office, they have better range of motion. That's not permanent, that's the numbing medicine, but it's a great sign. It means we're in the right place. Uh, it means the injection, the cortisone went to where you need it, and it tells you, it's a good indication that something's going to work. So uh, injections are something we use a lot of in the office. Physical therapy is very, very important for shoulders. Honestly, I, I use it a lot on most of my patients because, um, again, the shoulder has more motion than any other joint in the body, and it's very hard to do it all on your own. Um, therapists are trained in what they do. They, they understand shoulders. They understand the anatomy. They understand the pathology and what you're going through. And they have a great range of experience of patients who have had similar problems that they've guided through. So I think physical therapy is extremely helpful uh, for almost any shoulder condition for regaining range of motion, strength, and then finally function. Um, and then of course, I am a surgeon, so I am going to get to the surgery part. Uh, so what do we do with surgery? So let's say you've gone through all this, and it's not doing the trick for you. You still have problems. Well, the first thing we're going to I do is arthroscopic surgery. So there's two types of surgery. It's going to be arthroscopic or open. Um, if I can treat something arthroscopically, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to treat it arthroscopically. So that's usually uh, small incisions around the shoulder. Typically it's four, three or four. Each incision's about a quarter inch. 
and I use instruments that look like a pencil, I can go into the joint, I will see the joint, I can see everything, I'll be able to tell if there's arthritis, I'll see it, if there's a labral tear, I'll see it. Looking is even better than, uh, uh, is better than um, an MRI. Uh, MRIs are good, they're not perfect. I can see the rotator cuff, I'll see how big the tear is. If there is a tear, I can put stitches in that tear and I can tack it back down to bone where it tore off of. Um, uh, so that worked, uh, uh, so that's uh, an arthroscopic procedure. For a frozen shoulder, uh, I wouldn't do, I wouldn't typically do a scope. If a frozen shoulder needs surgery, we'll do something called a manipulation. It, it does sound a little barbaric, uh, but you go to sleep and basically I just stretch. I'll say stretch. Um, but we stretch really hard and we get that shoulder to move and it's better that you're asleep for that. Um, but you can wake up and the shoulder's moving better than it was when you went to sleep. So that's for a frozen shoulder. And for arthritis, the treatment is a shoulder replacement. Uh, and I'm doing a bunch of those. That's becoming an increasingly more common procedure. Uh, I probably do one or two of those every week. Um, and we make an incision that is an open procedure. It's not arthroscopic. The incision is about four inches long on the front of the shoulder, and I'm replacing both the ball and the socket. Um, uh, surgery takes a little over an hour. Um, and uh, for that surgery, you spend a night, typically spend one night in the hospital. For the rotator cuff, most folks are going home the same day. And that's the, uh, the world of surgeries. And that's it for the basics of shoulder uh, surg uh, uh, talk and anatomy and problems. I'm sure somebody probably has a question that I, could, I would love to address. Uh, do we have any questions about anything from the audience? Yes. Yeah, so I didn't get into shoulder um, laxity very much. It's not as common. So there are a few things. So, so the question was, um, what happens when your shoulder feels like it's coming out of the socket? Which it can. So a frozen shoulder is a shoulder that's too tight. And some people could have a shoulder that's too loose. A little less common, but it definitely can happen. Sometimes it feels like it's coming out of the socket, but it's just arthritis clicking or something clicking in there. So it's not always truly loose, but sometimes people do have loose shoulders. Uh, it's often the result of a dislocation. So if you had had a shoulder dislocation in the past, it might tear the, uh, the capsule and the structures that hold the ball into the socket. Um, and if that happens, then it's torn and it stays loose. Most of the time, that will heal with a sling, but sometimes people are left with a shoulder that remains loose. And you probably, I'm not, everybody's heard of shoulder dislocations. Most people, it's one time they have a dislocation and it doesn't happen again. But if you have a shoulder that continues to dislocate, that would require typically a surgical repair because the reason it's coming out of the joint is because something was torn and then it needs to be put back and then the capsule that holds the shoulder in place needs to be fixed. So popping can be all sorts of things. So the question is what is shoulder popping? And popping can be all sorts of things. A lot of times popping is scar tissue and you just feel this clunk 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 when you move it. Um, if it feels really gritty, that can be arthritis because honestly the joint surfaces can become like sandpaper when it gets more severe. So it, it literally feels like grinding. Popping is usually soft tissue, so that's usually like scar tissue in the bursa that pops. And you, the bone on top again, the acromion, this bone on top can kind of act like a guitar pick and the scar tissue underneath just gets strummed when you move it back and forth. So that can cause a lot of popping. Uh, pain is variable. Usually pain is caused by inflammation. So I, I would say a cortisone shot wouldn't be something that, that you'd need if you don't have pain. Usually cortisone's for the inflammation that causes the pain. We're trying to knock the pain down with a cortisone shot. So that wouldn't be necessary. But physical therapy to see how much we can get the muscles back into balance. 
uh, how much we can regain strength. You'll never know till you try. So, I mean, therapy would probably be a starting point for that. Obviously, x-rays and maybe an MRI scan if you if needed um, for diagnosis. But, uh, but therapy would be great for just seeing how good you can get your shoulder. Uh, he has a shoulder that's had multiple dislocations through his life and he has a sense of instability when he does things and now he avoids doing things to avoid dislocations. We call that activity modification and if you can modify your activity and stay happy, that's great, right? I mean, so a lot of people do, well, it hurts when I do that and they stop doing it and they're fine. Okay, so that's, that's an okay treatment. If you have shoulder instability every time you, you know, brush your teeth, well, you, you can't live like that. Um, so I'm sure that there probably is something torn in there, in the shoulder, if it continues to feel unstable. And it might, uh, if you, again, if you can happily avoid those positions, great. You don't need to, you know, therapy can actually help build the muscles around it. Uh, and help stabilize your shoulder. So therapy could be a first line of treatment. But if that doesn't work and you're unhappy, then we would fix the shoulder. So fixing again, that would be done arthroscopically. I would pull on the structures that are ripped and tie them back down to the bone that they're torn off of. Um, how long in a sling? Uh, it's very variable and it depends entirely on what we do. Shoulders uh, notoriously have long recoveries. Um, uh, some of the simplest things I do require a sling for only a week or two. Uh, uh, if I'm just taking off bone spurs, maybe just a week. But if I have to repair things, then they have to heal. And if I'm repairing things, I'm usually repairing them back to bone. So I'm usually tying a rotator cuff is back to bone or the capsule in a loose shoulder is going back to bone. And then your healing is at the speed of bone healing. So everyone has had a friend or knows somebody who has broken something, broken a wrist, broken an ankle, a collarbone. And you know that bones take at least six weeks to heal. So if I'm reattaching a tendon to a bone, it's typically going to take about six weeks. So a small rotator cuff tear may be four weeks, but we're still taking it easy. A big tear is going to be up to six weeks. So my typical range for healing uh, with a sling average is going to be between four to six weeks with a sling. And we do a little bit of physical therapy right after the surgery. So while you're in a sling, let's say a rotator cuff tear, because that's very common. And let's say it's a medium sized tear. So what's a medium tear would be two centimeters. Two centimeters is big enough to take a finger and poke it through the hole, but just one finger. If I can get two fingers, that's a really big tear. One finger is a medium tear. So let's say it's a medium sized tear and I fix it. I tied it back down to bone with some anchors. You're going to be in a sling for four weeks, but during that time, we don't want you to develop a frozen shoulder. So I'm going to have you do some exercises even when you're in the sling. So you can use your hand for typing. You can use your hand. You can bend your elbow for eating. So this is okay, even when, you, when my shoulder's not moving. So we encourage this. We even have you come out of the sling and do a little pendulum exercises. Nobody's trying to break records here. This is not supposed to hurt. This is supposed to be very easy. Just doing a little pendulum exercise. Shoulder shrugs just to keep it from freezing up. And then back in the sling. But uh, we do let you do some exercises even when you're in the sling for that first four to six weeks. So joint replacements are for a couple of reasons. The most common is arthritis. And the other reason is for severe rotator cuff tears that we can't fix. Those are pretty common and sometimes fractures. So there's a bunch of different reasons for joint replacements, but the most common that I'm going to see are severe rotator cuff tears and arthritis. So there are two types of joint replacements. There is an anatomic, which is like the regular one, and there's something called a reverse shoulder replacement. The anatomic is exactly putting the parts back together the way I take them apart. So I put a ball on the top of the humerus, I put a cup on the shoulder blade and put that back together. The reverse is you actually switch the ball in the socket 
So it sounds complicated, it, it works really, really well. We put a, uh, the ball onto the shoulder blade side and I put a socket at the top of the arm side. So I do a reverse if there's a severe rotator cuff tear. And I do a regular anatomic if the rotator cuff is working. I'll take care of making that decision. You don't have to pick. Um, but uh, they both work really well. And then to answer your question about immobilization, it's different for the two types. So actually the reverse, although it's a bigger surgery, the parts are held together more tightly and I only need the sling for two weeks with the reverse. But the regular one, uh, the joint is more the way it was originally. It's a little bit looser, uh, and so I need four weeks. So it's either two weeks or four weeks, depending on the type of shoulder replacement that I do. So the, the question is about exercising and what exercises are good for the shoulder and uh, should you avoid some exercises. So uh, exercise is part of PT. PT usually starts you off, but you need to continue it. Um, uh, pain as a guide is always a good guide. Uh, I think if you're doing something repetitively that hurts, that's always a bad idea. But some of the very basic shoulder exercises that you'll do in PT, the first is going to be range of motion because if it's limited, uh, it's going to lead to pain. So stretching, and we're going to do those three things, up, behind the back, and out. Um, your therapist will do more, but that's the basics that we're going to stretch to get your range of motion back. And then strengthening. You want to uh, improve the position of the ball and socket joint. So if you think about your shoulder blade, everybody really kind of do this. You move it around. Your shoulder blade is actually floating on your rib cage in the back. It's a floating bone. Your arm is supported on top of a bone that just floats on top of your rib cage. And the only thing that determines where your shoulder blade is, is muscle balance. So you're going to do a lot of exercises that improve the position of your shoulder blade. I'm going to do a little exaggeration, but you'll see what I mean. If we take our shoulder blades and bring them way forward like this and try to raise your arm, it's harder to get it up. If you bring your shoulder blade back, exaggerating, your shoulder, your shoulder clears it and goes up very smoothly. So nobody stands like this at attention. That's not reasonable. But you know, a little difference from a little bit forward to a little bit back just because you strengthen your upper back muscles can make a big difference for how you move. Um, so those are going to be some of the, the exercises and the therapist will use bands. You can get bands for home. Rows are great. I, uh, something I like to tell my patients in the office when they're thinking about exercise is that from your shoulders point of view, generally speaking, pulling exercises are better than pushing. So generally speaking, do more rows and pull downs and fewer bench presses and military presses. Um, uh, that's often very important for my, my younger, my guys on the football team or you know, my, my young college guys who are all working on their beach muscles which are all pushing exercises and their shoulders are all out of place and they walk in the office like this and I'm like, let's get that back, you got to strengthen your back, you got to work the rows, you know, it's like, but doc, that's not what I want to do. Yeah, <laughs> that's why you're in my office. Uh, so that was a great question about exercises. So night pain, that's a great question because it's so common. Um, why, like you're not doing anything at night, right? So why do shoulders hurt worse at night? And they do. Shoulders often worse, hurt worse at night. And there are a couple reasons for that. I mean, one might, might be because you have fewer distractions in your head, but I don't really think that's the main one. I think that it actually does hurt worse at night. During the day, we have gravity pulling on your arm and it opens up that space, that bursa space. And at night, you lose that and everything gets jammed up. And so you actually lose the space in your top of your shoulder and you jam your bursa tighter at night uh, just because you lose gravity. And so to counteract that, a lot of times patients, especially after surgery, will sleep in a reclining chair uh, because then you still have gravity or they'll prop their bed up with pillows 
So then they're in a semi-upright position and you still have some gravity opening up. So I'm, I'm quite convinced that that's the main difference is that at nighttime you lose gravity and everything gets jammed up. Yeah, so arthritis could, okay. but a lot of things can happen when you fall. One of them is a fracture and yeah. fractures are bones and they show up on x-rays. Right. No. So we always take an x-ray. But once you've done an x-ray and you've ruled out a fracture, if you're still having pain, well, something is causing it. Well, it's not pain, it's just that the range of motion. Okay, so it's not pain. So if you've lost range of motion, have you lost strength too? I think so. And then I'm concerned about the rotator cuff. I don't want to say that out loud, but yeah, rotator cuff, because that's a likely culprit if you've lost some strength and range of motion, is that you worry about the rotator cuff. And the only way I could confirm that is going to be an MRI scan. And MRIs are very good for looking at rotator cuff. So that would be a concern. All right. And uh, an MRI would help diagnose that. Okay, great question. So what, what are we using for uh, materials for uh, repairing uh, shoulder replacements? Yeah, your ball and your joint. Your ball and the joint. So uh, it's much like a hip joint, which are more common. So the ball is always made of steel, and it's a very high-grade surgical stainless steel. It's cobalt chrome. It's very, very hard. You don't want it to scratch at all. You want it to last forever. Um, the stem is made out of a combination of steel and titanium. Titanium is great. The body likes titanium because it can grow into titanium well, especially if you make the titanium a little bit spongy. And the cup is made of, we'll say plastic, but it's actually polyethylene. It's highly, highly cross-linked. And this polyethylene, these new cups with the new polyethylenes can last a very, very long time. They are cross-linked and they do not wear. Uh, and luckily, the shoulder joint of all the joints has the least weight on it. I mean, we're not walking on our shoulders. So they, they last an extremely long time. So the main answer is gonna be polyethylene in the, on the plastic cup and uh, very hard steel, very shiny steel on the uh, ball side. So, so the question is, well, a replacement doesn't necessarily last forever. How do you know when it wears out? I mean, we're hoping it lasts forever and they do last a very long time, uh, but how would you know? Well, the, the red flags are gonna be pain. It's gonna become more painful. And then, uh, Lots of different things could cause pain. I mean, it could become loosening. Sometimes if you have a regular shoulder replacement, you could still have a rotator cuff tear even with the replacement. Um, so we'd be concerned about that uh, loosening. And then the, uh, the biggest worry that we always have is infection. Um, it's less common down the road years later. Uh, it's more common you know, right after surgery, but it's not, it's not common. It's not a common problem, but it's, it's, a, it's a concern. Um, but usually pain is gonna be the, the, the flag that we're gonna look at and wonder what, what it is, then we have to work it out. So the question is, how many injections can you get? Um, and that's a great question. Um, I think if you're getting injections frequently over and over and over again at some point you're going to say this probably isn't working but the uh, the rough answer is we try to do no more than three in a year in the same joint so you could could get three in the shoulder and the knee um, it's a little bit of a judgment call I like to I don't like to give two injections um, even in different joints, I'd prefer to spread those out too by a month or two. Uh, but so I'm looking at three to four months between shots. Um, and it depends on the person. I have, you know, patients who are 95 years old and 
we're not going to replace their shoulder. I mean, it's just not going to be done. And so they can keep coming back for injections. If I have somebody in their 50s, I'm going to say, you know what, I, we really don't want to spend the rest of your life getting an injection every three months. We really need to look at another solution. So it depends a little on the patient, but the, the short answer is we're looking at uh, three to four months between shots in the same joint. But we don't, there are side effects from cortisone that we want to be aware of. So it does raise your blood sugar. If you have cartilage left, it will weaken the remaining cartilage. And it can accelerate arthritis a little bit, if you, especially if you do it too often. And it can weaken the collagen and the soft tissues around the joint if you do it too much. There is a new uh, cortisone injection that's just on the market that seems promising. It's a longer acting one. And it also seems to be kinder to cartilage. Um, uh, there are disadvantages of it if you keep doing it. Yes, there are. Uh, and, uh, I've only had one. <laughs> oh, well, that's... But... <laughs> a, a one is very safe. But... <laughs> yeah, one is very safe. I wonder what, why. Yeah, so it, it has side effects that we want to be aware of. Okay. It can be very helpful, but there are some side effects. You just want to balance. You want to balance things out. So the question is about neck pain. And, of course, neck pain causes arm pain. And there and is... The neck never hurt. And, and the neck didn't hurt. You feel it in the arm. And that's why I even had that slide early on, because there is a lot of overlap. And a pinched nerve in the neck manifests itself by pain in the arm. Sometimes there is pain in the neck, but not always. Sometimes the only pain you feel is in the arm, because the nerves run down there, even though the pinch is here. Um, yeah, so physical therapy is a fine place to start, but at some point you need to, you need, if it's not working, you need a diagnosis. And a diagnosis is probably going to be some kind of imaging. So, you know, x-ray and MRI will tell you what's going on, and then it's easier to target the treatment. I mean, it's okay to try you know, an anti-inflammatory and therapy first, and if it works, you're done. But if it doesn't work, then you need to circle back and get an answer. Driving after an injury. So, driving is all about safety. And I'm, I give you guidelines, but ultimately, you have to take responsibility for yourself, your car, your passenger, the other people on the road. So, it is, I'll give you guidelines and tell you when you can't think about driving, but the decision to drive is always yours. So, you can't drive if you're on a narcotic pain medicine. And you can't drive in a sling. The state police frown on and driving one armed, <laughs> unless you have certification and clearance. But you know, if it's just a temporary sling, that's a no-no. When you come out of the sling, my guideline is going to be when you can do this comfortably and you feel comfortable controlling the car in an emergency. So just think, if some child jumps in front, can you do this? If the answer is, well, I could do it as well as I could before, then you can drive again. So you want to know a number. So I usually it's a week or two after you come out of the sling. So that's going to be my rough number. But I won't put that on paper. Okay, I will not say cleared to drive. I never write a cleared to drive note. I only tell people when they can't drive. Okay. So the question is, what happens if you have severe arthritis and it's bone on bone? Is it possible to make it better and make it make it good enough to be happy, right? That's really what we're, what we're looking at. And the answer is you can definitely make bone-on-bone -bone arthritis better. There's no doubt about it. A cortisone shot goes a very long way at reducing the inflammation, and it's the inflammation that causes the pain. It's, it's not the, the rough bone. That, there aren't many nerve endings in the bone. It's actually the inflammation around that that causes the pain. So cortisone shot can dramatically decrease the pain. Physical therapy can help take what you've got and make it as good as possible by improving the range of motion as much as possible and to improve the strength as much as possible. Only you can tell me if that's good enough for you, right? But it's worth trying to see if you're happy. They're very good at what they do. The physical therapists are very good at what they do. And it's probably worth giving it a try. 
and they're going to be very careful about trying not to hurt you. Nobody, nobody wants to hurt you. And so the only way you'll know is if you try. And if it doesn't seem like it's working, then I would certainly tell you to stop. And you, you know, you, you, you probably, you'll need a prescription for that. Yeah, so you'll need a prescription. Any doctor, me, or your primary care doctor or another doctor, but you'll need a prescription, but it sounds like that would be an excellent next step. So sleeping on your side, and does it affect the shoulder? I often get that question after surgery. Does sleeping on my side bad? Um, it probably doesn't cause damage to your shoulder, but it can often be painful to sleep on your side. So I think your shoulder will let you know uh, if it's okay, but you know, you're really not going to make a rotator cuff tear worse, and you're not going to dislocate it. Well, you could, but you're not going to make a rotator cuff tear worse. You won't really make other problems worse by sleeping on it. It might hurt. So you listen to your body, but I don't think you're damaging your body. So waking up with pins and needles, sure, that's, uh, uh, that happens a lot to a lot of people. And it's really when you compress the nerves, all the nerves from, to your hand run from your neck they come out through your armpit, they come down the arm, and if you stretch them or pinch them by your position, that's what causes that sensation of pins and needles when the nerves get compressed. And then you wake up and then there you, you put it back where it belongs, but all the, the blood is rushing back to the nerves and the nerves are tingling and that's when you get that feeling. Um, it's rarely, per it's not a permanent problem, and the best way to fix it is by changing your position. So the question is, which is better, heat or cold? That's a very common injury that is certainly not limited to the shoulder. That is for any orthopedic injury anywhere in your body. And the answer is that they do different things. And if you think about what they're doing, it helps you pick which is better for you. And you said, well, one feels better. And honestly, that is a terrific guide because your body is telling you that that is better for you. So cold is very good for reducing inflammation and decreasing pain. So, pain, so cold works great for inflammation and pain. Heat is terrific for increasing muscle, uh, blood flow to muscles and joints. Heat can help loosen up a joint, especially if you like a frozen shoulder or something. Heat can increase blood flow and can loosen up tough joints and muscles, and it can decrease muscle spasms. So heat does different things. So they don't cancel each other out. If you do ice first and then heat, it's not like you're erasing the benefit. Um, a lot of times you'll do heat first or heat in the morning and then ice later in the day. A lot of times at physical therapy sessions, they might start with warming the joint up and get it moving, and then at the end of the uh, therapy session, put some cool packs on there to cool it down. So you could do both in the same day, no problem. But they do different things. Listen to your body. Usually what you need is what feels better. And uh, uh, if you're unsure, usually start with heat and then go to ice after that. So the question is, a, a, a shoulder that feels like it's dislocating, could it be a rotator cuff injury? And the answer is gonna be definitely yes, because the rotator cuff covers the shoulder and it does help to hold the ball in the socket. So it is one of the things that helps. So typically if somebody, if you come to me and you, tell, you give me a history of a shoulder that feels like it's coming out of place, uh, you know, we might start with the x-ray because that just rules in or out the arthritis, but the MRI is really going to tell us the story of what ligaments are working and what tendons are working and which ones aren't. So the question is about uh, vitamin treatment, like, like non-medical treatments, so non-pharmaceutical? Non Alternative. Alternative medicine. So yeah, I mean, I am a big believer in, in anything that works. Um, and so what works for different people is different. There are a lot of non pharmaceutical, non-pill, well not, they are pills, but non-pharmaceutical uh, anti-inflammatories on the market. And I have patients who swear by them. I mean, some of the popular ones are uh, turmeric, vitamin E, uh, fish oils, which are omega-3s, um, uh, and then for arthritis, so that, those are anti-inflammatory. Um, 
Uh, and then for the joints, uh, chondroitin and glucosamine. Collagen is, uh, you know, collagen is a form of protein. So I'm not familiar with specifically collagen pills or injections. Well, there isn't one, unfortunately. There is no one magic bullet, but we try a lot of different things. Uh, vitamin D helps a lot of bone and joint problems. So that is probably, if you made me pick one vitamin, I'd have to go with vitamin D3 because it, it helps bones and it helps joints and most people are deficient in it so so that would be my one thing and so the other one is um, one thing that we use a lot on knees but use less often on shoulders is the hyaluronic acid injections um, nobody asked me about that but I'll talk about it then so um, they are like Synvisc or Orthovisc are brand names that we often do for knees and they are FDA approved for the knee and they can work well and they do work in shoulders but they're not FDA approved so nobody pays for them and so that would becomes an out-of-pocket expense which is going to be somewhere in the hundreds of dollars less than a thousand more than a hundred yeah, and it can help with shoulders too but it is not FDA approved and so no insurance company pays for it Medicare doesn't pay and none of the other insurance companies. stem cell is uh, is probably more experimental and there's not good consensus on what a stem cell is so the studies are still coming out the one where we have more data is PRP platelet-rich <laughs> plasma that is a regenerative therapy where your blood is drawn in a tube it's spun down into a to a platelet layer and then that platelet layer where your own body's growth factors are is re-injected and it can help with both pain, inflammation, um, and in theory can hopefully regenerate some cartilage, but it, it definitely helps the pain and inflammation. Um, we've had very good results with that, also not covered by insurance. So uh, it's less expensive than stem cells and has better data. So it's, it would be my preference if we're gonna go that direction. It would be PRP. So the question is, how do you tell if one thing's causing, bothering something else, or how do you know what the root cause is? And one of the ways in the office I try to figure out what the root cause of a problem is, is by doing differential injections of lidocaine. So if I give you lidocaine in your shoulder and your pain goes away, then your pain is coming from your shoulder. If I give you lidocaine injection in your shoulder and the pain stays exactly the same, then I start to look. Could it be the neck? Could it be something else? And I start to widen my search. So that's one of the techniques that I would use. So I'm gonna, we'll end it there. Thank you, you've been a wonderful audience. Fabulous questions. Uh, thank you so much.